we are live. Good morning, everybody. Just getting our final setup here so we can make sure we can answer any questions you guys might have. If you have any questions while we're recording today, feel free to just put them in the comments. I got a video today that I'm going to be able to watch and monitor for any questions that you may have. So please feel free to put your solicit your comments and questions into the video here today. So please feel free. All right. Okay, give a couple of minutes just for people to sign on, anybody that wanted to watch today. Invite a couple of our friends to watch. Hey, Kobe, how you doing this morning? Hey, Kobe. How's everybody doing this morning? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, anybody who's watching at home. Hope you're having a great start to a great weekend. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about the universal pre-K and first first state pre-K. Let me talk a little bit here. And uh, what what uh, the organizations that are, are working together for this powerful initiative that would really transform Delaware. But I want to kind of talk about how did how did it get started? Who uh, you know we've worked on this in the past, correct? Is this is this a continuation or, or is this a new effort under new leadership? No, for what I know, I don't know of any organizations or any initiatives that were ongoing in the past that we're looking at universal pre-k there have been initiatives to expand kindergarten um and there's been ex initiatives to expand quality and so that's what you know the stars program is but in terms of universal pre-k i actually don't know of any initiatives that have happened in delaware to expand pre-k except for um one called i should say this is not universal but it's the ecap program which is the early childhood assistance program and that's the state program that kids can go into if they qualify for a uh, by income and obviously with universal there's no qualification by income it's just you know incomeless you don't have to worry about it, whether you make too much money or if you don't make enough money you don't get that pitfall of kind of you make a dollar too much and you lose your pre-k for your no kid. pitfall for universal pre-k in terms of that so it does not matter whether you're 100 percent, 200 300 percent above the federal poverty poverty line or below the federal poverty poverty line it does not matter universal pre-k is regardless of income wonderful yeah. thank you. so um what what uh what kind of program are we talking about here in terms of, I know, you know, we've talked about this, but maybe the public doesn't know, uh, general public doesn't know. What kind of programs are we talking about and who is going to be able to provide pre-K under this proposal? Right. So we're talking about universal pre-K, so it's voluntary. It's for four-year-olds and three-year-olds with IEPs or three-year-olds that have special needs. And really what we're talking about is a mixed delivery system. And so we want to make sure that Districts are able to provide this, but also that providers are able to provide that in the community. So center-based providers, um, family-based, uh, certified family-based providers, uh, Head Start providers, which you know obviously already exist, and um, pretty much almost anybody who's out there, we want to give an opportunity to provide it. When we're talking about what the program looks like, we're talking about something that's high quality. And so when we say high quality, we're talking about making sure that we're using developmentally appropriate curriculums. We're talking about making sure that teachers are getting paid well um, at the rate that K through 12 teachers get paid. Right now, about the pay rate that 
teachers are making in pre-k is about like nine to twelve dollars an hour um not a lot of money it's half of what's made if you were working k through 12 and there's no benefits obviously um if you didn't know the other piece that we want to make sure is that you're having teachers in there that are certified and have a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree depending on what level they're teaching at whether they're a teacher leader or a teacher assistant um and i think there's one more piece of it. Really, high quality also means like the wraparound supports that students need in order to be successful. So that's like screenings, um, making sure that students that have special needs are actually getting those needs met before and after care. Um, and the other piece that makes this high quality is that it's full day. So full day as in like think of what your school day looks like. Um, that's what we mean when we say full day. So from think you know eight to tw eight to two or eight to two thirty or seven to two thirty or anything like that wonderful okay uh so i know you you like me love data mm -hmm. and uh like a lot of our advocate friends we we dig into that data stuff because we're nerds and that's great mm -hmm. and so give me some stats on delaware where does delaware stand in terms of access to pre-k now without this kind of system so the national institute for early uh education research near and IEER, if you haven't heard of them, actually just put out a new ranking. So what they do is they take all the states and they rank the states on how they're doing as it relates to access to pre-K. Unfortunately, Delaware is 38th this year. We actually dropped from 35th, so that's kind of sad. Um, we are falling behind our neighbors and our peers um, as, a tar as a nation, and regionally we're behind just about most of the states that are surrounding Delaware actually have a universal pre-K program in place or have some form of pre-K that is more expansive and touches more students. Um, and so when I say like, oh, well, so we have something in place. So I mentioned the ECAP program before. We do have something in place. It's called ECAP. It's the Early Childhood Assistance Program that I mentioned. That program's been in place for about 25 years. Um, I want to say it was in the 90s, the late 90s, that they, they put that program in. And it's great, and it's been successful, but it's obviously limited. They've only actually hit about 845 students or children that are like three and four. In the whole um, state of Delaware. In the whole state of Delaware. So actually, less than 5% of kids in Delaware are actually in um, the state-provided uh, pre-K program. And it's a little, you know, that's sad. Like, there are a lot of kids in Delaware um, that are needed. There are 12,000, I believe, right now that aren't in any formal pre-K program. So they may be in um, something, they may be somewhere, but they're not in a formal pre-K program uh, in terms of three and four-year-olds. So, I mean, the data kind of shows that really there is an issue in terms of access. You can also look at the data to see that it costs on average, and this is on average, uh, about 10000 a year just to have childcare, and that's an average, right? So if you have more than one kid, you're talking about infants, parents are really paying out the wazoo when it comes to actually accessing any form of childcare. Um, and that's not even to say that every form that they're accessing is high quality. So that is not pointing in the great direction for Delaware. Yeah, and also not that not not that to construe pre-K as childcare because it's definitely a different thing, and, and a lot of people, you know, are very adamant about stressing that difference, and, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. But even in terms of just childcare, Delaware is is way behind. We're above the national average in the cost per month to a parent for an infant. Uh, last time I checked, it was around nine hundred dollars a month full time for an infant uh, for each kid. Give and information. <laughs> yeah, and you look at um, New Jersey and, and their tiered uh, assistance for child care. It blows ours out of the water. Same with Maryland; they blow mm -hmm. us out of the water. You know, once you hit uh, what is it, I think a little somewhere around two hundred FPL, mm -hmm. you basically are on your own. Yes. And, uh, you know, when you're looking at something that costs more than my mortgage just for one kid, let alone if you have multiple kids, right. that is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. When our neighboring states have figured out, you know, how to do this, mm -hmm. and it's vital. And now you're, and now you're telling me that we're falling behind in, in terms of pre-K, too. So what, 
not this is a rhetorical question, but what are we doing here to help our families, our working families that are, are struggling yeah. right now, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really great that the state has, has bumped out this, you know, paid maternity leave. That's a great program for working families, and I don't want to dismay that. I hope employers across the state. I'd love to see a buy-in so anybody can buy into that program and expand that out so everybody has an opportunity for paid maternity uh, parental leave because I think it is important to have both parents be able to access that so I'll be I'll get off my high horse though so what ha have we seen anything in terms of curriculum on what what would be taking place in the pre-k classroom under this program would there be a guidance uh, from the state or, or yes so well, I don't have exact answers on exactly what the curriculum is going to look like but I can tell you that we are looking at development of developmentally appropriate curriculum and really what you want is to make sure that like I said it is developmentally appropriate and that you're providing education during this time um, this is not you know we sort of distinguish a little bit between child care versus pre-k um, we're not asking for kids to be napping all day. Um, we do want to make sure that there is something that's helping prepare kids um, for the next step, which, you know, once you're a three and four year old, you're, you're pushing into kindergarten. Um, to go back to that data piece also, I mean, when you look at what happens when a kid gets into kindergarten, if you look at the early learner survey, which is a measure of kids coming into kindergarten, their first 30 days in there, looking at what is it that they know that they're coming in with, do they have the information that they need or the knowledge that they need in order to be successful throughout kindergarten and obviously beyond kindergarten. And a lot of what we're seeing is that like a third to half of kids are coming into kindergarten without what they need to be successful, not being able to count, not being able to write their name, not being able to recognize shapes. Um, and it make for some people, you know, it's like, oh, did my kid even need to know those things? Um, even if you did, in some cases, even if you knew what your kid needed to know going into kindergarten, you might not be able to access it. You might not be able to provide it. You might not be able to get a hold of a good program that has some form of a curriculum that's teaching kids what they need to know. So really what we're advocating for is a curriculum that's going to be aligned to K through 12. What do kids need to know when they're coming into kindergarten? Um, and what can they get in pre-K when they're three and four year old, three and four years old, so that they're coming into kindergarten ready? And we know that if you come into kindergarten ready, you're probably going to be more likely to be successful later in life. So, yeah, they've shown correlations between access to pre-K mm -hmm. and um, getting into college and being successful later in life. There's mm -hmm. a direct correlation there. Yeah. So we're talking about the foundation. Mm -hmm for the rest of these kids' lives. You really are. And, and really, that's, that's... And it's a generational impact, because if yeah, the kids yeah. do good, they do well with the parents later in life. Yeah. It's, it does impact generations, and then, of course, their kids will do better as well. Yep. Does this... Uh, the data that you've seen, does it show any particular demographics that are impacted by lack of this programming? Well, it's surprising because some people are like, oh, yeah, like low-income people all have access to some form of pre-K, some form of child care because there's purchase of care or because there's, you know, the ECAP program. And that's not necessarily true. Um, you actually find that people who are about 200% below the poverty level are actually more likely to not have Oh, excuse me, 200% above the poverty level are more likely to not have access to pre-K um, and not have access to, to child care in general. And they say um, purchase of care drops like a rock. 185. They just, I don't know if it was recent that they changed it, but I do remember being on DHSS's website looking at yeah. how much is the qualification for purchase of care. One week it was 200, the next week it was 185. So... You, you know, you, you really only have to make like a penny over, right? You really only have to make like a dollar over in order for you not to qualify. And just because you don't qualify for the federal poverty guidelines in terms of how they're going to allocate funds to you to get purchase of care or how they're going to make sure that you have access to pre-K or whether or not you qualify for the ECAP program, really, you could still not make enough money and still not be in their qualification. So there are a lot of people who are basically living in a precarious state saying, do I provide child care? Do I provide pre-K for my kid? Or do I do something else? Do I pay my bills? Do I quit my job? Um, it's It's a shame it's that you, that conversation happens in so many different aspects. And again, I wanna stress, if you have questions, just pop them in the comments. It's a shame that in so many different avenues of, of this conversation mm -hmm. of, of 
you know, a social assistance and a social safety net, that it, it is that defined threshold that once you're on the other side of it, and let's not pretend that 200% of the federal poverty level is actually a living, livable scenario, if you, particularly <laughs> if you have children. Um, so it's just insane it's to me. You know, you, again, going back to New Jersey, if you look at their guidelines on purchases of care, their, their child care assistance program, it, go, it keeps going. Mm -hmm. It keeps going up above 350%. Now, it does taper off, obviously. Uh, but, you know, you're looking at the cost for, for how much my family makes um, without any help, mm -hmm. again. And an infant's about 9, nine to 950, depending on where you're going, in right. Delaware. The New Jersey program, in Delaware, I'd be paying full boat. In New Jersey, I'd be paying around $200 a month. Now, that's manageable. Right. I'm not saying the subsidies are the answer to everything. Right. We definitely have to rein in costs and make sure people aren't getting cheated and delivering uh, low-quality services for high-quality costs, mm -hmm. 100%. But the idea that once you hit that rock-hard full stop mm -hmm. at 185, that magically you're wealthy enough to afford these programs, right. <laughs> which impact us societally, mm -hmm. right, is absolutely ludicrous. So. Uh, what have we seen any cost analysis on where we would be going if we uh, were to install a full universal pre-k system right so we're think let's talk about per kid here so if you look at k through 12 system per kid you can kind of see some variances between the districts but we're talking about fourteen thousand to sixteen thousand dollars per kid um, when we're talking about k through 12 right now we are about I want to say 10 you get 10 times less when or six it's four to ten times less if you look at how much we're allocating per kid for example pre the the, the ecap program ecap only gives about 74 7500 per kid um and that's obviously to a limited amount of kids less than a thousand kids less than five percent um what this what we're looking at is we want to propose fifteen thousand dollars per kid so that's on par with what we're asking for in terms of this is how much K through 12 costs and this is how much it costs for these kids but also remember it costs a lot for providers so we always think about you know parents pay a lot of money but it actually costs a lot of money for a provider to run their organization and to run it well to be able to pay and so when we're talk talking about 15,000 per kid I know it looks like a lot of money but it's actually just on par of what we're giving um, the K through, K through 12 and we know that like if we're starting off early shouldn't we provide that money right shouldn't we provide the right amount of money to kick a kid off early right to make sure that they're getting what they need to make sure they're getting high quality um, and also to make sure that part of this money is going to pay for the a child care worker so if you all don't know anyone who works in a child care system they don't get paid a lot of money all the time for what is possibly one of the most important jobs ever because right they're raising our future they're raising our kids and like I said 10 to 12 dollars an hour is not enough there's no benefits in some cases not everyone makes benefits and while we're asking for quality yes we're asking for child care providers and child care workers to get degrees to do what we know is best practice to make sure that we're providing high quality we have to make sure that we're asking in the same amount for um, giving the same amount to provide that the other piece of this comes back to what is the return on investment so like we're talking about money we're talking about these kids going in fifteen thousand dollars can seem like a lot per kid you know even when you're talking about K through 12 16 14 thousand dollars all those things seem like a lot of money um, but we're talking about return on investment here when you look at what studies show in some cases states can get up to 13 percent on a, a return annually on investment I mean when we're talking about this return we're talking about less prison right less people going into prison y'all know how I feel about that um, we're making sure that we're having kids that are actually graduating high school more likely to go into college more likely to go and get some form of post-secondary training we're less likely to see people who are being diagnosed as special needs which is a big deal because that can help us save money in some places we're also in some cases, we're actually seeing it where there's better relationships with their parents in the future. I mean, who'd have thought that, right? Like, you are getting the social and emotional support you need through a good, high-quality program. So we're going to see better relationships with parents, better relationships with their adults in their lives. I mean, to me, to the amount of money that we put in right now is kind of like, 
it's almost as if we don't care about our kids. <laughs> it's almost as if we, okay, well, if you have the money, you have it. If you don't, you don't, then it is what it is. But right now, the amount of money that we're putting in right now, the quality that we're, we're providing our kids right now, it's not enough. And there are people out there who care and there are people out there who are trying, but we've got to be able to put a system in place that, like you said, is a social safety net. It catches parents, it catches providers, and it gives our kids the best of what they need in order to survive and to thrive. So I, I've heard a lot of politicians and our, our leaders in the political spectrum talk about the, you know that they want a program like this. So as anybody came out, well, you know now that it's, looking, mm -hmm. it's no longer just this idea that they can run on, um, has anybody yet came out and said, "I'm ready, let's do it." Um. I we gotta say, work on that. We do need to definitely push on our legislators, but we do have legislators I think that would be open to having conversations about this. For example, Tizzy Lockman I think would really be open to having conversations about this. Um, I've seen her in meetings that I've gone and talked to this about with other groups and um, she was, she looked excited to really go into the conversation. They just had a kids caucus in, um, it was a meeting, basically they have these, I don't know if it's monthly or however they have but basically legislators have this thing called a kids caucus and they get together and they talk about kids issues this past kids caucus they bought near in um, that national organization with research run early education um, they brought near in to talk about where Delaware was and a lot of legislators during that meeting were expressing that they wanted to make sure that we were doing better for our kids so while yes there definitely needs to be a push on all levels of leadership to make sure that we're providing good for our kids I do think Think we have some champions out there that we can turn to and people out there that we can start having the conversation with yeah and just for clarity for that was not a plug for my senator oh just no <laughs> she's yeah. my senator too yeah. so, so we're not that was not a plug <laughs> we're not biased at all uh, so what can people do to get involved in this effort? So How First State Pre-K, um, this is this is the the initiative. First State Pre-K, it's an issue campaign. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, so there's multiple ways. If you are an organization and you have an interest in getting involved, really what I want to see you do is send in your logo or ask us questions about what does this look like so that you can either get to the point where you feel comfortable sending in your logo so that you can start joining on our advocacy calls, on our organizing meetings, etc. If you're an individual, I really am urging people to go to firststateprek.com go and sign our petition. We really want people to be able to put their voice out there. And part of that is signing our petition to make sure that people know that you support expanding pre-K in Delaware for three and four year olds. Um, and the other thing you can do is actually just go talk to your legislator. Um, talk to your legislator, ask them, ask them, what do you do? What do you, what do you care about this um, in terms of universal pre-K, in terms of high quality uh, early education for three and four year olds? universal child care, all those questions you should be asking your legislators. And then the fourth thing I would say is look at what we have on the First State Pre-K website. There is some research on there that will help you understand exactly what does Delaware already have, how are we actually doing when it comes to preparing our young learners um, in terms of the outcomes of our youngest learners? Are they actually coming out well? And what does that mean for them in their future? And there's research on there in terms of if we were to you know, be looking at other states, what are other states doing? How can we look at what Pennsylvania does, what New Jersey does, whatever state you have an interest in? And is that program the right program um, aspects of that that we can bring to Delaware? So really sign the petition. If you're an organization, uh, consider joining us as an organization. Um, if you go to firststateprek.com, you can get all the information you need in order, that, um, in, in order to sign the petition and to become a supporting organization. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks everybody for watching live. Thanks everybody who will be watching. Please share the video so everybody gets this great information out there and we build up this coalition and get this done here in Delaware. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you.